Isaiah chapter 48. In this chapter, Isaiah declares the correction of Judah and their stubbornness and yet God's faithfulness and love for Judah that he would deliver them still in spite of their stubbornness. Still dealing with the Babylonian nation, using them as a tool of judgment towards the children of Israel, Isaiah, Jacob, and a reference to Judah here, uh, that they are a wellspring from Judah. And so we see the hypocrisy of Israel itself. It says in verse 1, hear this, O house of Jacob. Now, Jacob, we know the story. You go back to Genesis. And we read the story of Jacob from his father Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. We know that Jacob came forth as a conniver, a deceiver. And he was, by nature, that, a conniver and deceiver. He, he connived his way to his birthright, though it was given to him by God. But he deceived uh, those around him with the help of his mother. And so here, Isaiah is saying, the house of Jacob, you deceiver, who are called by name Israel. Yet you're Jacob, but God calls you Israel. Israel means ruled by God or governed by God. That is, God has your life and He's governing it in this world. As believers and Christians today, we are to be governed by who? By God. Well, how do we know what God wants us to do? By the Word of God. And so when we read the Word of God, then we know what the Word of God tells us to do as believers. And so we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we become doers of the Word and not just hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Because then we're like that man who looks in the mirror and then we walk away and we forget what we even look like. And so it's so important to be in the Word of God so that we continue to be governed by God. But we get off track, don't we? We begin to govern ourselves. We begin to... Read less, receive instruction, and then we begin to make our choices based upon what we remember, like God wants us happy. I know He wants us happy, and so I'm going to make this choice because this makes me happy. It's not hurting anybody, and so I'm going to go down that path because God wants me to be happy. And we begin to interpret the Scriptures according to our own wisdom and knowledge. Instead of letting the scripture interpret itself and believing what God has said in his word and then living it out in this world. That is what God wanted of the children of Israel. Though they were Jacob, they were still deceiving. They were still struggling. Just like many of us, just like Paul said, the things that I know to do good and yet I don't do those things that are good. And yet the things I know not to do, I find myself doing them. Nothing's changed, has it? We still struggle with the flesh and the spirit. And the problem is, is that God is good and loving and caring and He wants to pour out a blessing upon us, but we really hinder Him. And yet we ask Him and blame Him, why are you doing this, God? Why is this happening to me? When in reality, it's our stubbornness. It's our choices and our allowing our flesh to rule over us. And then we blame someone else. It's his fault, or it's her fault, or it's the way that I grew up, or it's my parents' fault, or it's the pastor's fault. And in reality, it's your fault. And we're going to see that as we get into the text. And God is going to be very clear. He wants to rule over us, but yet we continue to be like Jacob deceivers and have come forth from the wellspring of Judah. Now, Judah, we know, was a cruel person. We know that Judah um, ended up... uh, uh, having an affair with Tamar, and, and, and then found to be unrighteous, that Tamar was more righteous than uh, Judah himself, and then deceived uh, the nations, and then came to the conclusion that he was less righteous than, than Tamar. And so in a sense, what, what God is saying here to the children of Israel, you're like, you're like Judah, you come from the same water, from the same well. In other words, like your mothers are the same. You're corrupt, you're, you're cruel, you're wicked, you're evil. You know, and so forth, so as he identifies him. And then he says, Who swears by the name of the Lord and makes mention of God of Israel, but not in truth or in righteousness. They swore by the Lord. Oh, I swear by God I know him. Oh, God is my God, and he is my king, and he is my Lord. And yet, 
They did not know truth or righteousness. That is hypocrisy. When we take on the name of God, God wants to rule our lives. We say that He's our God and that He governs over us, but He really doesn't. That's hypocrisy that's in our lives. Either we believe in God or we don't believe in God. And you have to make that choice. If you make the choice to believe in God, then you need to live up to that choice. Israel claimed God's name. They identified with the holy city of Jerusalem. And they even gave the appearance that they trusted in God. We're believers in Christ Jesus. I go to Calvary Chapel of Inland over there. You know, I go every Sunday morning and I go to the men's breakfasts and so forth. And we identify ourselves with the true and living God, with Jesus Christ, and with a good Bible teaching church. But then when we go home and we're alone, we're sinning. We're corrupt. We're wicked. We're evil. And that's hypocrisy. And God wants repentance from that hypocrisy because really it's just an image. It's a facade. It's not reality. You know where the term hypocrisy comes from. It's a term that actors would use. They would put on different masks. And of course, as they were acting out in the old days, they, they didn't develop the form of acting as we do today, where, where you see some actors and they're, they're so good at it that, that it is amazing. They literally take on the part you know, of an individual, whether it's a druggie, or, or whether it's a boxer, you know, and, and you watch him, you're like, that guy is really good because he just really acts very well, but that's not who he is. In the old days, they would literally wear masks because they didn't develop, develop that, that art yet, and so they wore a mask. And so if they were mad and angry at someone, they put a mask on, and you would look, and okay, they must be mad and angry because of ugly, mean faces there. Or if they were laughing and smiling, they'd put another mask on with smiles. And yet, they deceived the audience. The audience says, oh, they're happy. Oh, they're, they're jubilant. Oh, no, they're angry and so forth. And the audience bought into it and they were deceiving the audience because of the hypocrisy. But in reality, that's not who they were. And you may be deceiving everyone around you, but you don't deceive God because God knows your heart. And God is saying that here because He sees through the hypocrisy. He sees through the veil. He sees through the imagery that you portray. And people are so good at imagery. You know, it is amazing. Praise the Lord. And they're very soft-spoken. And they're very nice. And they're very cordial. And, and they'll go to you and they'll say hi. And they'll be friendly. And, you know, and they'll tell you stories of when they were kids and when they did this and so forth. And then they'll throw in a couple of things about someone else and how mean they are and this and that. And you go, poor kid. You know, and, and this hypocrisy grows and grows, and then all of a sudden, boom, they got you. They reeled you in. You believe everything that they say. You know, and it's all a line of facade. Because in reality, their hearts are wicked and evil and deceitful. It's amazing. I, I've, seen, I've seen these people who come into church and they're mingling among people and God bless you and I love you and let's do this and so forth. And they'll even help. And then I've seen them write wicked letters. Wicked letters with profanity and everything uh, at people. And it's just amazing how that can come out of that person who professes to be this other person when in reality that's not who they are. Because what comes out of the heart is really what's, what's in them. What comes out of the mouth is really in the heart. And what did Jesus say in Matthew? I think it's Matthew uh, 17. That every idle word will be judged. Every idle word will be judged. What you say to others will be judged by God in the end times. You'll be, you'll be held accountable to those things. You know, so many call themselves Christians, but they're living like the world. They're living like the world. They're enjoying the world things. They're not like Christ. When I got saved, <clears throat> I wasn't seeking God personally i didn't decide in my mind i'm going to go seek out god i'm going to start looking for him no it was something that god did in my life to draw me to him he began to seek me and i and i remember i had been listening to a, a radio station and i started listening to christian radio and i was listening to the words that were being spoken and they were they were piercing my heart you know they were real because it was truth and it's alive. And they were revealing things in my own heart. And I'm thinking, wow, wow, how does that guy know that? Wow, that word was oof. It really got to me. 
Why is that person that way? Why do they have peace? Why do they have rest? And yet, I don't. I'm struggling within myself. And nobody knows me. Nobody knows about the things that I'm doing. Only I know in God. And yet, that person's talking about those very things. And then all of a sudden, God, with a sword, pierced my heart deeply that I was guilty. I was guilty and I was going to the pit of hell. And I knew that. I knew that with all my heart that I deserved to go to hell. Just as much as a criminal who, who gets caught stealing or murdering somebody and the police take him and cuff him and bring him before the judge, he knows that he's guilty and that he deserves to go to jail. That feeling that, yeah, I did that and they caught me and I'm going to jail. That's how real it was to me. That I deserve to go to hell because of my sins. And my sins were many, 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 many. Uh, I mean, I've broken every Ten Commandments on there. I mean, every one of them. There was one that I didn't leave out, and I'm sure a few more that I made up my, myself. That's how bad I was. And then God, through a message, said, there's hope through Jesus Christ. And when that hope came, it, it was like a lifeline. And I was drowning in a pit of fire, and I grabbed hold of that line, and I was pulled out into an ice snowy rain, you know, and it was just like, what? Wow, and it changed me, because a weight was taken off of my body, in a sense, my sins, because of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, that I felt different, I felt new, something drastically changed in my life, and I had such a hunger for God, I wanted to know this God who saved me, this God who died on the cross, this God who I knew about growing up as Jesus Christ and dying on the cross, but did not have a personal experience with that God at all. That personal experience is what the church needs today because we don't have that. We're coming to Christ intellectually. We're believing His Word by faith, but the experience is not there. Now, whether you come intellectually or by faith, the experience has to come one place or another. The experience has to come where all of a sudden you're born again. You become that new creature in Christ Jesus, and you know that you know God, and you know that you were a sinner, and He saved you from the pit of hell, and now you just want to serve Him, you want to love Him, you want to be obedient to Him, you want to be like Him. That's what the word Christ-like is means and so when we call ourselves christians we're saying i'm like christ and that's what the jews were doing i know god we worship in jerusalem and god's saying and you don't even live in truth and righteousness that's hypocrisy either we believe it or we don't either we're for him or we're against him there is no gray area in this area you either know him or you don't know him Otherwise, you're living in hypocrisy. He goes on and says, For they call themselves after the holy city and lean on God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is His name. I mean, they even say, We trust in God. We lean on God. And, of course, he clarifies who this God is. He's the Lord of hosts. I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from my mouth, and I caused them to, to hear it. Suddenly I did them and they came to pass. What God is saying here is, look, I told you from the beginning that Babylon would take you and they have, just as I said, and it's come to pass as I said, and I also said that I will deliver you and I will deliver you and that will come to pass because I knew that you were obstinate and your neck was an iron shenu. And your brow was bronze. In other words, obstinance means stubborn. Stubborn. I like the word stubborn. Because when you use the word stubborn, you know exactly what you're talking about. You know, I had four boys. They were not as stubborn as I have seen other little kids in the past. My boys were very disciplined because I was a good disciplinarian. And they didn't get away with anything. I, I ruled with the hand. In Spanish, you would say the chancula, you know, with, with the shoe in your hand ready to whip them if they got out of the line. But I have seen kids so stubborn, they will sit there and lay on the ground and you cannot pick them up. They will just 
dead and you're trying to pick them up and they're so stubborn, they're not going to move, they're not going to budge, they're going to scream, they're going to yell because they're so stubborn, they're not going to do what you say. And they're screaming and yelling in the store so much so that it embarrasses you and you're just like, you know, you just want to grab them and run out of the store really quick because they're so stubborn. The word stubborn, stubbornness, obstinance means unmovable. You will not move from that place of what you think is right. And God is saying to the children of Israel, you're stubborn. Your, your neck is like an iron. It's iron and you can't even move it. You know, I was out there uh, today before they put the cross beam on the, on the uh, post there. And I was at the lower part because I'm short and so I can't reach very high. And I tried to move it and I couldn't move it. That, that's iron. And I thought, that is not going anywhere. That is iron in three feet of cement, and I cannot move it. Now, I saw the guys as they put the beam at the top, that um, as they were putting it up there, the top seemed to move a little bit more than the bottom. But it was still there. It was iron, and it's not going to move. God's saying, you're like iron. You're unmovable. You're obstinate. Even from the beginning, I've declared it to you. Before it came to pass, I proclaimed it to you. Least you should say, my idol has done them, and my carved images and my mold images have commanded them. What he's saying here is that I prophesied that this is what I was going to do because I don't want you to go back and say, oh, my idols helped me out. Because they were in idolatry. They were, we saw it last week. Baal, Nebo, these gods of learning, these gods of agriculture. Oh, they say they know God, they worship in Jerusalem, they go to the temple, they offer up their incense and so forth. Then they go out to their fields and they have their little idols. And there's a produce, there's a harvest. And they begin to worship their idols and say, oh, look what you have brought me. And God says, no, 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 no. I'm telling you beforehand so that when that does happen, you will know that it's me. We do the same thing today. We go to church and then God blesses us and then we go, man, I'm glad I'm smart. <laughs> man, I'm glad I have a skill. Man, my families should be happy they got me living with them. No, 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 you missed it completely. The only reason you're here is because God has predestined you before you were in your mother's womb to be here. And he has a plan for your life and made you the person that you are through his grace and his mercies. It has nothing to do with you. You have the responsibility to give him glory for what you do have. And so when you get blessed, thank you, Lord, for giving me the wisdom. Because it can only come from you because I really know me. I don't have much wisdom. We still do it today, just like they did back then. My wife should be happy I'm her husband. <laughs> really? You ought to be happy she's your wife. You ought to be happy anybody even likes you. <laughs> you ought to be happy that someone will even shake your hand because you're so wretched and evil and wicked you don't deserve a thing. We really don't, guys. We really don't. I was getting upset because... Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to be careful here. I'm dealing with somebody that... that um, I've been dealing since January. I'm entitled to some some revenue. <laughs> and so they said they were going to take care of the situation, and they haven't. And so then I called them up, being nice. You know, I gave them two months. Called them up, okay, uh, this season's over. So I called them up, and, oh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah I forgot. I had a note there. I'll, I'll get, let me get back to you. So I waited a week, nothing. Then I waited another week, nothing. So then I called them again. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got really busy. I will call you tomorrow. And then all of a sudden they didn't call. And then I waited another week. And it's like, oh, yeah. And so then I finally I'm getting upset. Who do they think they are? They, they, they gave me their word. And I, and I started, you know, thinking of all my rights, you know, and, and then their business. And what kind of business are you even running and so forth, you know. And then I finally I called one more time and says, I've been calling you since January, Oh, well, you know, they'll get back to you. I, I promise. They know what it's about, and so they're going to get back to you. That was last week. And going through this, I realized, <clears throat> who am I that I would even demand anything? Lord, you are my God, and you are my provider. And for me to fight and to demand and to get upset, in reality, I deserve hell. And so I just said, all right, forget it. 
<laughs> I just said, forget it. Obviously, they, they're not interested. Uh, they don't want to help. They don't want to do their job. And that's between them and God. I'm going to trust in God. I'm just going to let him have it and let him take care of it. And if they call me, they call me. And if they don't, then I lose out. God will provide another way. We don't deserve a thing. We really don't. But yet we think we do. That I am your husband. I deserve this and that. I'm your wife. I deserve this and that. I'm the pastor. I deserve this and that. You don't deserve anything. You deserve the pit of hell. But you don't understand the wisdom that I have. No, it's because God's given you that wisdom. <clears throat> because of God's grace and God's love. Just as he declared it in the beginning so that you do not begin to worship your idols. You have heard, he says in verse 6, see this all. <clears throat> or see all this. And will you not declare it? I have made you hear new things from this time. Even hidden things. And you did not know them. They are created now and not from the beginning. And before this day you have not heard them. Least you should say, of course I knew them. Surely you did not hear. Surely you did not know. Surely from long ago your ears was not open. For I knew that you would deal very treacherously. And were called a transgressor from the womb. And here you thought I was being a little mean. Saying that, that you don't deserve anything. But it's what the Bible says. God is saying, yeah, otherwise you say, yeah, I, I knew that. We all do that, don't we? Someone comes up and they're giving us information. Oh, I know that. I know that. Oh, you don't have to tell me that. I already knew that. Yeah. And God's saying, I told you these things and you're pretending like you know all this, but I'm telling you plain and clear because you're a transgressor all the way from the womb <laughs> before you even came out. Now, it's not that they that they came out, they sinned and became a transgressor. They were inherited as transgressors because of the fall of Adam and Eve, right? And so we took on their sin nature. So by that sin nature, by inheritance, we are sinners. Now the evidence that we are sinners is that we sin, which proves we're sinners. It's not that we sin and thus we become sinners. No, because we're sinners, we sin. And so it's not that we, we have worked ourselves to a place of transgression. No, that is in our heart. And transgression is willful sin. We do it willfully. We know it's wrong, and yet we still do it because we're obstinate, because we're stubborn in our walk with the Lord. So God says this, For my name's sake, I will defer my anger. And for my praise, I will restrain it from you so that I do not cut you off wow in other words in spite of you I'm going to be good to you in spite of you I'm going to love you I'm going to remove my anger for my name's sake because in my character I'm holy and I'm pure and I'm loving and I want you to know no matter what you do I love you no matter how stiff naked you are I will always be there for you. And my anger is not against you. It's amazing how we will begin to think that God is angry with us. Things are going on in our lives and we think, He's really upset. What have I done? And God isn't. He's not angry. We just think He's angry. We think He's upset. We think He's doing these things when in reality He's not. And, and the truth is, is that we brought them on ourself, right? We brought them on ourself. We really bring on a lot of this stuff ourself. Oh, we can blame the devil. The devil made me do it. The devil's after us. But you know, there's also this thing called the flesh. And the flesh lives with us and we deal with that flesh. And that flesh is sinful. And that flesh gets us into a lot of trouble. <laughs> You know, when the flesh gets angry and mad, then comes the words right out of the heart. You know. But God says, I still love you. And I'll never leave you or forsake you. You know, when we feel like God has left us or forsake us, it's not that he left us or forsake us. It's that our sins or our doubt or our lack of faith and trust in him is what's making us feel that he's left us or forsake us. That's why we have to believe what the word of God says. I will never leave you nor forsake you, he said. 
The word never means never. And so you can take that to the bank and deposit it and begin to write your checks because it's true. He will never leave you. When you feel like He's left you, you know, and especially when you're sick, because I, I know I've been there. And when you're sick and you're hurting, you're in pain, you're thinking, where are you, God? Why aren't you here? And He's like standing right next to you. And it's because of your lack of faith and trust in Him that you're feeling that. Because that's when it happens. When you're not getting what you want, that is the release, the healing. And so then you're thinking, well, God must not be here because He's not doing this. No, He's doing that for a reason you'll see in a minute. So in, for His name's sake, in other words, His name is... is His name, which is His character, is so important to Him that He will continue to love you so that you can never say that God did not love me, that God was not fair, because He's beyond fair. He's beyond fair. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake, for my own sake. I will do it. For how should my name be profane, and I will not give my glory to another. So, he allows you to go through the furnace for his name's sake, to glorify him as you go through those things. For his name's sake. To glorify him. He sets those afflictions in your life. We don't like the afflictions, but he sets those afflictions. The problem is is that we think we're the center of the universe. That everything revolves around me. My family, my neighbors, my friends, my churches, everything revolves around me. When in reality, everything revolves around God. What do you want, God? And isn't that that what Isaiah is saying in the very beginning in chapter 1 and 2? You know, he's saying, Lord, here I am. Send me a man of unclean lips. Direct me, Lord. Guide me. When we ask Christ into our hearts, we are saying, Lord, I want less of me and more of you. That's what John the Baptist said. I must decrease, you must increase. Oh boy. Where are we at with that anyway? 100%, you know, decrease and God's 100%. Where are we at? You know, where's that level? Are we 90% and God's only 10? You know, how much of you has decreased? And how much of God has increased in your life. That comes through maturity. When you give your life to the Lord. And and again, when I gave my life to the Lord, I said, Lord, I just want to serve you. Whatever you want me to do, that is what I will do. And so I started cleaning toilets. I started organizing things and cleaning up and paper and things like that. And I was content in doing that. Whatever the Lord wanted. I was on my hands and knees with those toilets after people used it during Sundays and Wednesdays. Cleaning around the bowl, around all the little knobs and making it the best I can make it so it wasn't dirty. Because I was doing it as unto the Lord. I still do that today. Everything is unto the Lord. It's not a matter of trying to get through it. It's not a matter of trying to be perfect. It's a matter of my heart doing it unto the Lord. It's the Lord's work. And I'm a part of it. Not because I deserve it or because God needs me, but I get to be a part of His work because He's chosen me to be a part of His work. And that's grace and mercy on His part. And I'm still the same as I was back then. I'm open to what God wants me to do. I'm kind of like Moses at times. And I've learned through experience and just time that even though I know that something should be done this way, but because people are not willing to do that, you learn to just let it go. You let let them do what they want. Kind of like with Moses when they wanted a divorce. And he was like, no, you can't get divorces. They kept it. Okay, here's your certificate. Go get your divorce type of thing and they get less of God than what God really intended for them to have because of their stubbornness and their lack of saying Lord what do you want for me as a pastor that's my job is to lead this place but if people don't want to be led guess what I can only follow the Lord and everyone else will do what they want to do and I understand that I understand that 
until they understand that we need to submit to his will and his plans. He has set up the government. He has set up the structure of the church. I didn't. He set it up. He called me here. He called the, the elders, the deacons, and so forth. And we need to understand that and come under that and say, Lord, how am I used in that area? How am I used to further and the betterment of these people that are here for your glory, Lord? That's submitting to his will. I must decrease that he may increase. And John the Baptist literally gave his head so that the Lord would continue on with his ministry. And he was willing and glad to do so for the glory of God. How many of us are willing to give our head? How many of us feel like the universe revolves around us when it really doesn't revolve around us? It revolves around God and we need to join it. So he says, listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, my called, I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. So again, he doesn't, he doesn't want to give his glory to anyone. He will not give his glory to anyone. Why? Because, look, I'm the called. I'm the Alpha, the Omega. I'm the first, I'm the beginning, I'm the last. I am it. I am God. I sit upon the throne. Indeed, my hands have laid the foundations of the earth. My right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call them, they stand together. Can you do that? <laughs> but the universe revolves around me. Yeah, you can't even hold it together. What do you mean by that? I mean, God is saying here, look, my hand <laughs> stretches out and holds the universe together. And by the way, that's our God. And so why are you worried? Why are you doubting? That's the God you serve. Nothing is impossible for Him. We can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us, right? Can we jump off buildings? No. We can do all things, that is the will of the Lord in our lives through Christ Jesus who gives us the strength to do so. Not do stupid things. We can do all things according to the Word of God, those boundaries that He has set for us to live by. Why? Because God is the center of the universe. He holds everything in the palm of His hands. He holds it all together. He says, I call to them, and they stand there. Can you imagine that? Uh, that's why we revolve around the sun, and the planets, and the whole solar system. It's because God just calls, and they're obedient to Him. And He's making an analogy here to the children of Israel. You're stiff naked, but yet look at the universe. They're obedient to my call, and you're not. All of you assemble yourselves and hear who among them has declared these things. The Lord loves him. He shall do his pleasure on Babylon and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. Um, the whole motivation of this is his love for his people. You know, please don't get me wrong. By, by my preaching here concerning the stubbornness of Israel, yet understand that God is revealing this to them because he loves them. It's all motivated by love for them. I'm dealing with this right now with my blood family. Every time I get in contact with them, I'm, I hear this, you don't love us. You don't invite us over to your house. You don't come out to dinner when we call you to come out to dinner. You don't come over and have barbecues. You don't do, you know, and it's like, you're Mr. Goody Two Shoes and doing all this. And, you know, and I started thinking about that. I'm like, it gets frustrating. It's like, I don't even want to be around you anymore now. And I almost want to lash back at them and like, what are you talking about? And the Lord just showed me my own heart. And I started thinking about it and I said, it's not with malice. I don't do it with malice or even intent. You know, they don't call me up on the phone. Hey, come out to a barbecue. Yeah, I'm going to get them now. Yeah, I'm not going to go. I'm, nah, I'm going to really get them, you know. I don't have that at all. It's because I'm here. Because God's love is pouring out to His people here. And my calling to me is more important than my own family. My studying time. And my, my time to let my body heal so that I can continue to do what God's called me to do is more important than barbecues and dinners and all of those things at times. And it's not with malice. 
but it's with love for God's people that I endure the other aspect of it. You know, God is saying here, I call you these things, but I tell you, I love you. And to show you that, I will judge Babylon. And I will set you free, and I will restore you. He says, I even, I have spoken, yes, I have called him, I have brought him, and his way will prosper. Come near to me, hear this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Now, you, you see him pleading here with his people. And, and notice that he's saying here that I was there, that I am. Now, many of the commentators are saying that this is literally the Messiah speaking and pleading with the children of Israel to come to him. So this is a, a, a picture of Christ pleading with the people. Uh, you remember that Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and, and so forth, and they said, my father is Abraham. Our father is of Abraham. And Jesus, before Abraham was, I am. Remember that proclamation? That's where Jesus said, I'm God. You know, of course, they misunderstood and said, wait a minute, you're not yet 30-something years old. How can you? <laughs> I mean, that's a long time ago. Duh. Would you miss? <laughs> I'm God. I'm deity. I was there. I was in the burning bush when Moses said, who shall I say sent me? I am has sent you. That's Jesus, the Messiah. And he's pleading with his people, just like he would plead with us today. In a loving, caring, desiring us to come and sit at his feet and just love him. Just love him. And really it's the love of God that causes men to repent. It's the love of God that, that God is looking for in our hearts. It's not the religious and it's not the works. It's not our self-righteousness. It's not even our sacrifices and offerings, he said. It's our heart that he wants. Nothing else. Nothing else but our heart. <clears throat> it's the whole motive of doing things. It's the reason that we're here. To give and to pour out our hearts to the Lord. Because He has our hearts in His hands. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. And there's a lot there, your Redeemer. He redeemed you. He paid the price for your soul. The Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Now again, a shepherd leads you, but if you don't want to follow, then you can't go and you can't prosper. But if you follow Him and His leading, then you will prosper in those times. He will bless you. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Go back to First John. If you love me, you Keep my commandments. And God says, if you keep my commandments, I will bless you. And he's telling them here, if you, if you follow my lead, you will prosper because you're following my commandments. But you won't heed my commandments. Then your peace would, be, would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your descendants also would have been like the sand and the offspring of your body like the grains of sand. His name would not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. You ever hear the phrase that we limit God in our lives? Uh, hear the phrase, we can miss out on God's full blessings? You know, why is that? Because we're not following His commandments. We're not being obedient. We haven't fully given, us, given Him our lives fully. And so He can't use us completely the way he wants to use us if we were to fully surrender guys <clears throat> i really believe that this church would be huge i really do if we were if we would truly surrender to the lord i could remember when i got saved just so excited about the lord that I would read to my family every night and pray with them every night. And I would talk at the tables about Christianity, about salvation. And I would drill it into them every single night. And everything that came out of my mouth was Jesus this and Jesus that. And it would offend people. I could remember thinking, 
Monday night, let's go witnessing. Tuesday night, let's go to the men's study. Wednesday night, let's go to church. Thursday night, and just like fill my life with God, God, God. That's what they did during the, uh, the whole movement in Calvary Chapel, right? These kids just said, let's go and worship the Lord. And there was no formal worship. They just came and they sat and they worshiped. They really worshiped. And they were there before worship started so they could get a seat and they could sit down and they could worship their God. And Chuck said, I don't care if they're not wearing shoes. I don't care if they have long hairs. They're worshiping God. And you without, you with the suits and the shoes, you're late. <laughs> you're not even worshiping God. That likes a, a pure and a contrite heart. And that was the movement. They were in love with God and they wanted more of God. And God was pouring His blessings on them and using them for the littlest things. It didn't matter what it was. I remember hearing a story. Greg Laurie came in and said, I want to be used of God. What do you want me to do? Chuck anything. He says, go change that doorknob. <laughs> the doorknob? Yeah, go change that doorknob. Okay. And he went out and bought a doorknob. A doorknob. They were excited about changing a doorknob. I understand that completely. They're telling us that we're living now in that place where there is no spirit moving among the people anymore. And Calvary's trying to capture that back. I think that they might be getting it back. We just heard this last Tuesday that in back east Philadelphia, the spirit is moving in a fresh way over there. People are coming to the Lord. People are going to worship. The churches are growing uh, more than ever before. And over here in this area, it's churches are falling apart. Statistically, people don't want to go to church anymore. They're bored you know, and so forth. But nothing's changed. Uh, they're having, having afterglows. They're, they're seeking the Spirit of God, the, the power of God. They're being open and pure before the Lord. Um. <clears throat> And so God's moving in a fresh way. See, when we open ourselves to the Spirit and His leading and saying, Lord, here I am, use me in any way that you want me to be used. And then when that door opens, you go, that's when God begins to work in our lives in a mightily way. Yeah, but we need to be more organized. I understand that. See, the organization, that's the problem, you know, is we get too organized and we limit ourselves and not let the Spirit move. So go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing, declare, proclaim this, utter it to the ends of the earth, says the Lord, has, has redeemed his servant Jacob. And so the Lord still loves them and he's still going to set them free from their captivity of Babylon. And they did not thirst when he led them through the desert. He caused the water to flow from the rock for them. He also split the rock and the water gushed down. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Now, he reminds them of the wilderness walk, right? I believe this strange fire that John MacArthur started with this strange fire conference that he started just several months ago. I don't know if you're aware of this. John MacArthur uh, had a conference called Strange Fire, and he accused these Pentecostal churches and also named Calvary Chapel among them as being um, unscriptural. A problem within the church. But what that did was it fired up Calvary Chapel because they began to fire back and say... We're not an extreme Pentecostal, nor are we extreme Calvinists like you. We're a movement of the Holy Spirit and a, and a movement that God has a hold of by fire. <clears throat> and because of that, a lot of Calvaries now I'm noticing are going back to afterglows. Remember the afterglows? They're going back to seeking the Spirit. Uh, this whole past conference in Philadelphia was all about seeking the Spirit. And the gifts were being used, tongues and prophecy and various things like that. And I think that John MacArthur opened up a door that he, that he didn't even know that he should have touched, you know, if he would have known. But it's firing up Calvary Chapel because Calvary Chapel pastors and leaders, they have a heart 
to be simply what God simply wants them to be. They really do. And because of that, God uses them in a fresh way. And so God is saying here, just like in the wilderness, how they struck the rock and the water gushed forth and this refreshment came, it filled you, you were thirsty and your thirst was quenched and so forth. You know, that's the moving of the Spirit. But as far as the wicked, there is no peace for the wicked. There is no peace for the wicked. And again, in conclusion, and I'm going to close up here. In conclusion, this is what God is saying here to the children of Israel. Look, you are stiff Nick, you're stubborn. You won't give me glory, nor will you give me your heart. You're into idolatry. You profess me, you worship in my city, but yet your heart is far from me. Thus, there is no rest for the wicked. There is no peace. Why don't I have peace? Why is my life the way it is? Why am I struggling? Why don't I have the joy of the Lord? Why am I not serving Him more with excitement and joy and the filling of the Holy Spirit? Because there is no peace for the wicked. Because there's sin in your life. Because you have to relinquish this world, die to it, die to self, and say, Lord, I want more of You. I simply just want more of You. Help me to decrease so that You can increase, Lord. When was the last time that you shared your faith with somebody? When was the last time that you were sitting with someone and you were looking for an opportunity to talk about church and maybe even invite them to church? I know a lot of you do that. I know that. So please don't take this as an accusation. This isn't just for you, but it's also for those listening on YouTube and the audio too. Because they're sitting there at home not going to church, thinking that that's okay, and it's not. They need to be involved in part of the body of Christ. Yeah. When was the last time you got out? When was the last time that you intended to witness to somebody today you know, and share your faith with Jesus Christ? To be an example. When was the last time you had joy and peace in your life where you were just like, man, Lord, you are just so good. Even in the trials and the furnaces, you're just so good, Lord. You're just, you're wonderful, Lord, and you're amazing. You know? That's the joy of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's the joy that God wants us to have in our lives, in our relationships, in our marriages, in our families. He wants them all in line with His will, following His commandments, seeking after Him so that He can pour His blessings upon us. And until we do that, the blessings, the full blessings of the Lord will not be poured upon you. We limit him completely. It's like damming up a, <clears throat> a river. You know, we think damming it up so that we can use it at any time, but yet we're not allowing it to completely flow and allow it to do what it's supposed to do. Let's let us, let's let God humble us before him and say, Lord, help us to decrease that you may increase in our lives.